Hi guys, this is Dr. Weber and I'm going to be going over chapter 14 of Advanced Anatomy and Physiology. Chapter 14 is about the brain and the cranial nerves. We're going to start by talking about the major regions of the brain. First we're going to talk about the cerebrum, which is the largest portion of the brain. The cerebrum has two cerebral hemispheres that's divided by a longitudinal fissure. The outside of the cerebrum has the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is made up of gray matter. We can see elevations in the cerebral cortex. Those are called gyri and the elevations are separated by indentations that are called sulci. Sometimes we name these sulci. For instance, we name the central sulcus and we name the lateral sulcus. It's believed that the brain used to be much smaller in humans and as humans evolved, the brain became bigger and didn't have as much room in the uh, cranial cavity so that it had to fold in on itself and that created the gyri and the sulci. The cerebral cortex or the cerebrum is the area where the most complex things happen in the brain. Things like conscious thoughts, sensations, intellect, memory, learning, complex movements. All these things are very complex and they are performed within the cerebrum. The second largest area of the brain is called the cerebellum. And here in the cerebellum, this is where we adjust ongoing movements. And we'll talk more about both the cerebrum and the cere cerebellum uh, later on. Next, we're gonna look at the diencephalon. So the diencephalon contains the mostly the thalamus and the hypothalamus. There's also the epithalamus, which contains the pineal gland, and the pineal gland produces melatonin. The um, largest part of the diencephalon, which is the thalamus, this is, we've often nicknamed it the final relay station because this is where all sensory information has to synapse before it goes to its uh, respective areas in the cerebrum. Then we have the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus has many, many functions in it. The hypothalamus has centers for emotions. It kind of shares that responsibility with the limbic system. It has autonomic function, and it also produces hormones. Then we're gonna look at the brainstem, and the brainstem is made up of three areas, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. The midbrain uh, is the most superior part of the brainstem, and this contains centers for visual and auditory information that will trigger reflexes. And it also has centers for maintaining consciousness. Then we have the middle section of the brainstem, and that is called the pons. And the pons connects the cerebellum to the brainstem. The pons also has some nuclei for both somatic and autonomic motor control. Finally, the most inferior portion of the brainstem is called the medulla oblongata, and this area connects the spinal cord to brain centers that regulate blood pressure, heart rate, and digestion. So as we look at all of these parts of the brain, we can see the medulla oblongata is actually the most basic, fundamental region. It's the region that keeps you alive and as you uh, ascend in the brainstem to the diencephalon and then to the cerebrum things get more complex and so um, we get into the more complex areas in the cerebrum. Let's look at the ventricles really quick. Um, there are two lateral ventricles, there's a third ventricle and there's a fourth ventricle. The third and the fourth ventricle are connected by a duct that's called the cerebral aqueduct. The lateral ventricles are connected to the third ventricle by a passageway called the interventricular foramen. Cerebral spinal fluid passes through the ventricles from the lateral ventricle into the third ventricle into the fourth ventricle and then from the fourth ventricle that leads into the central canal of the spinal cord. Here's a picture showing the two lateral ventricles. There's one in each cerebral hemisphere and they lead into the third ventricle through the interventricular foramen. And then from the third ventricle that leads into the fourth ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct. 
and then from the fourth ventricle it leads into the central canal of the spinal cord. So now we're going to look at the cranial meninges. So the cranial meninges have the same three layers that the spinal meninges do. The innermost layer is called the pia mater. The middle layer is called the arachnoid mater. And the outer layer is called the dura mater. The dura mater is going to fold into that longitudinal fissure as well as fold into the fissure separating the cerebellar hemispheres. And so you can see in this picture where uh, the dura mater is actually folding. And when it folds, it creates what we call dural folds, and we name those dural folds. And then in between the two layers of the fold, it leaves a space, and that space is called the dural sinus. The dural sinus are venous structures. And so these dural venous sinuses are inside the folds and they drain the venous blood to the veins of the neck. You can see in this picture where the superior sagittal sinus is. That is the dural venous sinus of the falx cerebri. So let's look at those dural folds. Here's a dural fold uh, that's going to go down into the longitudinal fissure. It's called the falx cerebri. And as it folds, the, uh, you can see the veins inside the folds. You can see the inferior sagittal sinus and the superior sagittal sinus. Those are uh, venous structures within the folds of that falx cerebri, and they are going to drain into um, the veins of the neck. You can also see the tentorium cerebelli. This is the uh, dural fold that covers the top of the cerebellum. And then you can see the falx cerebelli. The falx cerebelli is the dural fold in between the two layers of the cerebellum. Now we're going to take a look at the cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid is a fluid that supports the brain, it cushions the neural tissue, and it transports nutrients to all the exposed neural tissue. Uh, the cerebral spinal fluid is going to circulate through the ventricles through the lateral ventricles into the third ventricle and then into the fourth ventricle and then from the fourth ventricle into the um, the spinal uh, the central canal of the spinal cord and it's also going to leave the fourth ventricle into the subarachnoid space and travel all the way around the um, spinal cord and then all the way around the brain so let's look at how cerebral spinal fluid is formed it's produced as a filtrate from fluid that's leaking out of the capillaries in these areas that we call the choroid plexus. So the choroid plexus are these special areas where um, the neural tissue sort of invaginates into some of these, uh, into a couple of the ventricles. And as it folds into those ventricles, we can see that a blood vessel, a little capillary is in those folds and then lining the neural tissue are these specialized cells that are called ependymal cells. And the ependymal cells help to produce this cerebral spinal fluid. So fluid is, um, is leaking out of these capillaries and it passes through the interstitial fluid and then it passes through the ependymal cells. Then the ependymal cells are gonna secrete the cerebral spinal fluid into the ventricles and the ependymal cells also remove waste from the cerebral spinal fluid. All right, so here we can see a picture. Here's, we're looking at the ependymal cells here. This is actually the choroid plexus that contains the ependymal cells. And then here's another choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle. So we see this choroid plexus here and it invaginates or it, it folds up into the lateral ventricle. And then down here, we can see the choroid plexus in the um, fourth ventricle, and it kind of folds into the space uh, between the pons and the cerebellum, right? So we have uh, cerebral spinal fluid being produced in these two areas. And so cerebral spinal fluid is produced and it fills up the third ventricle and it fills up the lateral ventricle and it moves down through the interventricular foramen here and it flows into the fourth ventricle. And then in the fourth ventricle, the cerebral spinal fluid is gonna leave through some openings and go into the subarachnoid space. 
So remember the subarachnoid space is a layer in here in between the pia mater and the arachnoid mater. So it, it leaves the fourth ventricle through these openings that we call apertures and now it's in the subarachnoid space. Once it's in the subarachnoid space, it's going to flow all the way around the spinal cord and it's going to flow all the way around the brain in that subarachnoid space, bathing it, transporting nutrients, and transporting the waste products back where they can be removed. We also see that from that fourth ventricle, the cerebral spinal fluid is going to leave um, the fourth ventricle into the central canal of the spinal cord and bathe the inside of the central canal of the spinal cord. So all of that is getting um, bathed with this cerebral spinal fluid. Now up where we have the dura mater by those dural folds, here you see the two layers of the dura mater. That arachnoid mater is, um, there's some finger-like projections of the arachnoid into that um, sinus area. And so those finger-like projections of the subarachnoid extend into the superior sagittal sinus, and this is where the cerebral spinal fluid is going to be absorbed back into the veins, right? So we see um, up here in this area, this is where the, this is the subarachnoid space, so this is where the cerebral spinal fluid is, and it's gonna be reabsorbed back into the veins, into those um, superior sagittal sinus. Okay, here we can see a picture of the superior and inferior sagittal sinus. So here's the superior sagittal sinus, here's the inferior sagittal sinus, and they're both gonna join together and then they're gonna leave the brain uh, through the foramen magnum and into the internal jugular veins. And that's how blood is drained then from the brain area. Now the brain needs to get nutrients. It needs to get carbohydrates and it gets lipids and it can't store these nutrients. Uh, it also can't store oxygen. And so it needs an extensive blood supply in order to um, have the proper amounts of nutrients and oxygen. So the arterial blood is going to deliver the blood to the brain through the internal carotid arteries and the vertebral arteries. A cerebral vascular accident or a CVA otherwise known as a stroke, is when blood supply to a certain brain area shuts off and neurons are gonna die within minutes without oxygen or nutrients. All right, next we're gonna talk about the blood-brain barrier and the barrier that's between the blood and the cerebral spinal fluid. So the blood-brain barrier is formed by capillary endothelial cells that are connected together by tight junctions. Only lipid-soluble complexes are able to pass oxygen, ammonia, lipids, steroids, prostaglandins, and small alcohols can pass through these cells. Water and ions have to pass through protein channels, and large water-soluble molecules can only pass by active transport. So in this picture, we see the blood-brain barrier. And the blood-brain barrier is formed by um, the, here's the, you see the, um, capillaries of the brain and you can see these endothelial cells and these endothelial cells are connected together very tightly um, by junctions, by tight cell junctions. And then we have these astrocytes and these astrocytes you can see that they have these processes and these processes are covering making another barrier on the outside of the blood vessel and that way uh, a lot of the components inside the capillary bed cannot get through those barriers and can't get out into the blood, into the neural tissue. So these are blood vessels um, surrounding the uh, outside of the brain. They're not able to get into the brain. And then we have another complex which is called the blood cerebral spinal fluid barrier. This is on that inside in, um, in those uh, ventricles. And in here you can see the capillary and then you can see the um, cells. You again have these tight endothelial junctions between the cells, and then you see the ependymal cells. Okay, so they also form a very um, strong barrier so that a lot of things can't get out of the blood and into the cerebral spinal fluid. So um, that's great because then a lot of bacteria and viruses are not able to get into the cerebral spinal fluid and they're not uh, also not able to get into the interstitial fluid in the brain tissue. 
and so they can't get at these neurons. So that's the big thing. We want to protect all these neurons in the neural tissue. That's wonderful unless there actually is an infection and when there's an infection we want the antibiotic to be able to get through that um, blood-brain barrier and through the blood CSF barrier so that we can protect those neurons. A lot of times what has to happen is the blood-brain barrier has to be damaged enough and the um, blood cerebral spinal fluid barrier has to be damaged enough by the infection in order for the antibiotic to um, move into the cerebral spinal fluid and move into the tissues of the brain. Okay, now we're gonna go through each one of the areas of the brain stem and then the diencephalon and then the cerebrum. And we're gonna start with the lowest end of the uh, brain stem, the most inferior end of the brain stem, which is called the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata has three groups of nuclei. One nu group of nuclei controls visceral functions. These are called the reflex centers. One group of nuclei is the sensory and motor nuclei, and the last one is a relay station between the brain and the spinal cord. So first we're gonna look at the reflex centers, right? So here's the reflex centers. The two reflex centers are the cardiovascular centers and the respiratory rhythmicity centers, all right? So here we see them right here, the red and the purple right there. So the um, cardiovascular center, what it does is it, uh, it controls your um, heart rate and strength of contractions. So even though the heart is going to beat on its own, this cardiovascular center can increase the heart rate or decrease the heart rate, and it can also increase or decrease the strength of contractions. And by doing that, it's also going to affect the, the blood flow. The respiratory rhythmicity center, the purple area there right next to it, that um, center sets the respiration or sets the respiratory rate. So it's um, going to help to set that rhythm of respiration. The next nuclei we're going to look at is the reticular formation. So here we can see the reticular formation and then you can see it up here. It actually is gonna extend all the way up through the pons and then into the midbrain. And the reticular formation has a lot of autonomic responsibility. It helps to control respiration and blood pressure and body temperature. It helps to control endocrine functions and body posture and somatic reflexes. It helps you with alertness and also with sleep. So we will talk about the specific area of the reticular formation uh, when we get to the midbrain, which is called the reticular activating system, but that's in the midbrain. So we'll talk about that then. Then there's also these relay stations. So these relay stations are called the gracil nucleus and the cuneate nucleus. And so here we see them right here, these blue structures. So what they are receiving, they receive information, um, sen sensory information, uh, that's going to travel up in these tracks to the gracil and the cuneate nucleus and they're going to synapse in here. The next neuron that it synapses on is going to go up to the thalamus. So it's, it's, if you remember in the peripheral nervous system we talked about the ganglia, that's where neurons synapse because that's where cell bodies are found. In the central nervous system we talk about nuclei because that's where cell bodies are found. So an ascending sensory neuron is going to synapse in one of these, um, either the gracil or the cuneate nucleus, and then the next neuron is gonna ascend up into the thalamus. Then there is the inferior olivary nucleus. So I want you to know about this one, the inferior olivary nucleus, this big green one right here. There's three nuclei within that inferior um, olivary nucleus, and they relay commands from the cerebral nuclei to the spinal cord. So they're bringing information um, from the cerebrum down to the spinal cord. They're going inferior, just like the name tells you it's going. Right? So that's the medulla oblongata. Then we're gonna talk about the pons. The pons links the brainstem to the cerebellum. So here you can see the cerebellum over here, and then here's the pons right here. And there's four groups within the pons we have um, cranial nerve nuclei, we have a respiration nuclei, 
there are nuclei and tracts leading to the cerebellum, and then there are the pontine fibers. Okay, we'll start by talking about the nuclei for the cranial nerves. Um, the cranial nerves that are gonna exit the pons are cranial nerves five through eight. And cranial nerves five through eight are gonna uh, relay sensory information, and they're also gonna um, send out uh, motor commands. So we're gonna talk about the cranial nerves at the end of this lecture. Okay, then we have the respiration nuclei. So here's the apneustic and the pneumotaxic centers. These are the respiration nuclei of the pons. So they're gonna adjust the respiratory rhythmicity center in the medulla oblongata. Um, we're gonna talk a lot more about that when we get to the respiratory system. Then we're gonna look at the pontine fibers. So the pontine fibers over here, these are the transverse pontine fibers, but they're gonna connect um, the two cerebellar hemispheres together. That's what they do. They run in a transverse direction and they kind of connect the two hemispheres of the cerebellum together. And then we can also see the reticular formation. It's running through the pons and it's gonna go up into the midbrain from the pons. Okay, now we're gonna go a little more superior into the midbrain. The midbrain contains two areas. One area is called the tectum, which is the roof, and the other area is called the tegmentum, which is on the um, wall and the floors, right? So first we'll start looking at the tectum. So the tectum or the roof contains uh, an area called the corpora quadrigemia, and the corpora quadrigemia contains the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. So here's a, here we can see, there's the superior colliculi right here. And then here's the inferior colliculi right below it, right? Now these two centers are going to um, receive information from the eyes and the ears, and then they're going to have a reflex happen when they receive that information. Now the superior ones, they're the ones that are gonna receive information from what you see, and the inferior ones are gonna receive information from what you hear. So if you think about it, your eyes are superior to your ears most of the time, right? For most people, your eyes are not at the same level as the ears, your eyes are superior to the ears, so you can kind of remember it that way. Superior colliculi deal with um, reflexes from vision, and inferior colliculi, they deal with reflexes from what you hear, from auditory information. So um, for example, the superior colliculus, when you see a bright light, you have a reflex that happens. If it's really bright, your eyes and your head and your neck will all react and you'll kind of flinch away from that bright light. So that's what happens, that's, that's what the superior colliculus coordinates, okay? Then we have the inferior colliculus. The inferior colliculus is going to um, receive information from the ears, like a loud noise. It will um, generate a command to your head, your neck, and your trunk. So if you hear a really loud noise, you're gonna flinch away from that with your whole trunk and body. Um, you know how that is when you hear a really loud noise and you jump, right? So that is the inferior colliculus that is programming um, or coordinating that. Okay, then we have an area, um, here we have the reticular formation, let's talk about that next. So this is the end of that reticular formation and in that reticular formation area in the midbrain is an area called the reticular activating system or RAS. And this is an area that when stimulated is going to keep you alert and attentive and when it's inhibited, then a person would be unconscious, right? So um, that's the difference. If it's stimulated, you're alert and, and attentive, and if it's inhibited, then you would be unconscious. Okay, then we come to another area called the tegmentum, and the tegmentum is on the, um, the walls and the floor of the midbrain, and they contain the substantia nigra, and they contain the red nucleus. So here we see this is the substantia nigra, and then here we see the red nucleus. All right, so the red nucleus is red because it has a lot of blood vessels going to it, and the substantia nigra is dark, nigra means black, 
and it has more gray matter in it and that's why it looks this real dark color and so they call it substantia nigra. So the substantia nigra, this area here, the substantia nigra releases dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that inhibits the basal nuclei. So it's going to block the basal nuclei from doing what it does. All right, so um, in Parkinson's disease, it's the loss of the substantia nigra activity that's the problem. So keep that in mind when we talk about the basal nuclei. So the substantia nigra here is going to um, inhibit the bas basal nuclei. And if you have Parkinson's disease, then the substantia nigra is not working and then there's nothing inhibiting the basal nuclei. Okay, then we have the red nucleus. And here's the red nucleus. And the red nucleus is going to transfer information from the cerebrum and the cerebellum to the muscles of your upper limbs. And this happens at a subconscious level. So when you're um, moving your arms and not even really um, knowing that you're doing it, it's at a subconscious level, that is coordinated in the red nucleus. Here's another picture showing the corpora quadrigemia and you can see the superior colliculi here, and then you can see the inferior colliculi here. Quick, where is the superior colliculi receiving information from? That's right, the eyes. And what happens when it um, gets stimulated? That's right, you're gonna have a reflex and you're gonna move your head and your neck away from that bright light. Uh, what about the inferior colliculus? It's receiving information from? That's right, from your ears, it's receiving loud noise information and then it's gonna coordinate a response so that your whole trunk and your neck and everything um, jumps by that loud noise. So next we're gonna talk about the cerebellum. The cerebellum, just like the cerebrum, has a cortex. It has folia, which are all these folds. It has an anterior lobe and a posterior lobe. It has a primary fissure that separates the lobes, separates the anterior from the posterior lobe. It has a vermis, and the vermis separates the right hemisphere from the left hemisphere. And it has a flocculonodular node between the roof and the hemispheres. Okay, on the outside of the cerebellum is gray matter. And then when we look on the inside of the cerebellum, we see the uh, white matter that looks kind of like branches of a tree and there's the tree trunk and we call that the arbor vitae, arbor vitae. The cerebellum produces rapid automatic adjustments to your postural muscles in order for you to maintain balance. So when you're moving or standing uh, you're going to have these rapid automatic adjustments going to your postural muscles so that you don't fall down. The next thing that it does is that it refines learned movement patterns. So for instance, you've learned how to walk and you've learned how to run and you've learned how to pick up a cup and you've learned how to play a piano maybe and you've learned how to ride a bike maybe. And all of these learned movement patterns have been refined by the cerebellum. The cerebellum helps to make those movements smooth. The diencephalon um, you, you know, it's at that head of that stalk. So here you see the brain stem and that leads up into that round area at the top of the brain stem. Um, that's called the uh, diencephalon. And the diencephalon helps to integrate sensory information with motor commands at a conscious level. All right, so everything below that we've been talking about either subconscious or unconscious um, functions like heart rate and um, respiratory rate and all those things in the brainstem, um, those are unconscious. And then we finally got up into the, you know, up into the midbrain area and we got to the subconscious level. Now we're getting up into the diencephalon and now we're at the conscious level. So it's going to, it's going to in integrate um, the sensory information that's coming in with the motor output that's going out. And most of the, um, most of the neural tissue in the diencephalon is going to be in the hypothalamus and the thalamus. Now we have talked about the epithalamus in the past and the epithalamus is a small area um, that contains the pineal gland and the pineal gland produces melatonin and melatonin helps to keep your day-night cycle. Uh, it's released right before you go to bed so you get sleepy 
and then the levels drop and then you wake up and then right before you go to bed it's released again and you get sleepy and then it drops the levels drop and then you wake up um, so that's kind of what melatonin does uh, we'll probably talk about that a little bit later now we want to talk about the thalamus though the thalamus is the final relay station for all sensory information so that means all of the spinal nerves that are bringing in sensory information, they're bringing in information about um, maybe a temperature change that you feel on your skin, or maybe um, a touch from your clothing, or pain from your shoes being too tight, or vibration because your cell phone just vibrated in your pocket, um, or any of the general senses. That information is coming in through spinal nerves. And then we have some special um, sensations coming in through cranial nerves, like um, your vision comes in through a cranial nerve and your hearing comes in through a cranial nerve and gustatory, your, your sense of taste comes in through a cranial nerve and all that information, all that sensory information is going to go to the thalamus and it's going to um, synapse on other neurons in the thalamus and then get sent up to the cortex. Now the only sensory um, sensation, the only sensation does, that does not have to go to the thalamus is what? That's right, the olfactory nerve. The sense of smell does not have to go to the thalamus. That's the only sensation that does not end up going to the thalamus. Okay, so we look at the thalamus. Um, the third ventricle kind of divides the thalamus into a right and a left side. And then what we're gonna do is we're looking at one side here. We're gonna look at, um, here's the thalamus right here, okay? Um, and you can see that there's different nuclei within the thalamus. There's the anterior nuclei, the medial nuclei, we see the pulvinar nuclei, um, and then we see these ventral nuclei. So we're going to talk about those uh, and what each one of those do. We will start by looking at the um, anterior nuclei. So the anterior nuclei here, this part of the thalamus is really kind of part of the limbic system um, and that's where emotions are generated from. Okay. Then we look at the medial nuclei right here. So the medial nuclei right here. This one's going to connect to the frontal lobe and it helps to make you aware of your emotions. So the anterior nuclei uh, makes you feel the emotions, but the medial nuclei makes you aware of those emotions. Then we're going to look at the pulvinar, um, which contain the dorsal nuclei. So here, right here is the pulvinar. It contains the dorsal nuclei. Um, this sends sensory information to the cerebral cortex. So whenever you're feeling those sensations, you know, whatever it is, um, whether it's, um, you know, touch or vibration or pain or um, temperature, whatever that is, it sends that sensory information off to the cerebral cortex. So those tracks, those, new, those neurons are going to synapse here and then go up to the cortex. If we look underneath the pulmonar, uh, pulvinar, we see the medial geniculate body and the lateral geniculate body. And they're going to receive information um, they just receive information about vision and hearing. So the auditory uh, input, anything you hear, that's going to go into the geniculate, the medial geniculate body. So that's not for the reflexes, right? That's just bringing, you know, from your ear, from that vestibulocochlear nerve in the ear, it's going to synapse in the medial geniculate body. And then from your optic nerve, the optic nerve is going to synapse in the visual um, input area, which is called the lateral geniculate body. So medial is ears, and then lateral is eyes, okay, so vision. All right, then we're going to look at the ventral nuclei. So here's the ventral nuclei, and there's three different sections to that. In the ventral nuclei, we have um, these areas are basically uh, one area is receiving general sensory input, one of them is receiving information from the um, cerebellum, and one's receiving basal information from the basal nuclei. So basically, it's just receiving information from other areas of the brain. Things like touch, pressure, pain, temperature, proprioception, all the general senses you know, are going to um, be received in this ventral nuclei. 
All right, next let's take a look at another area of the diencephalon, which is called the hypothalamus. So let's talk about the different functions. First here, let's take a look at it. This whole area in here is the hypothalamus, right? It looks kind of like a quadrilateral uh, structure and it's right below the thalamus. So it's still part of the diencephalon. Okay, now we're not gonna go through each of the individual areas of the hypothalamus, but I do need you to know what the functions of the hypothalamus are. First of all, the hypothalamus secretes two hormones. It secretes ADH, which is the anti-diuretic hormone, and ADH restricts um, the water loss at the kidneys, and it also secretes a hormone called oxytocin, and oxytocin contracts the uterus and the mammary glands in a female who is either going through labor or is uh, breastfeeding. And in the male, the oxytocin um, constricts or contracts the prostate gland to release secretions. The second thing that the hypothalamus does is that it regulates body temperature. We call this thermal regulation. If your body temperature falls, then the peripheral blood vessels in the skin are gonna constrict to reduce the heat loss at the skin. So that's how it can help to, it can send that message out to those blood vessels telling them to constrict. And that would um, keep the heat at the core of your body so that it's not at the surface of your skin and being lost. The third thing the hypothalamus does is it controls autonomic function. It controls the pons and the medulla to help regulate heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, and digestion. And the fourth thing that it does is it coordinates um, voluntary and autonomic functions. It helps you to prepare for an emergency. So if you are, um, say, um, you're preparing for an emergency because you hear the fire alarm go off, right? Automatically, your heart rate and your respiratory rate are going to go up. Next, the hypothalamus regulates the circadian rhythm. So the circadian rhythm is a daily cycle of activities. Uh, it's going to receive input from your eyes. So it receives input from the retina. It's looking to see is there light or no light out there. And then it helps to adjust the pineal gland. So if it's getting dark, it'll tell the pineal gland to release melatonin. It's going to uh, um, adjust the reticular formation. That's your consciousness. So it's going to, you know, slow down the activities and inhibit the activities of the reticular formation when it's time for you to sleep. And it regulates the hormones that are going to be released from the hypothalamus. So when we get to the reproductive system, we're going to talk about how the hypothalamus releases certain hormones at certain times. And we'll talk about that later. The next thing the hypothalamus does is that it has a subconscious control of your skeletal muscles. So your skeletal muscles are going to contract when you have emotions related to rage, um, pleasure, pain, or sexual arousal. So for example, um, when a person is going through the emotion of rage, you see how their facial expressions change. Well, those are just subconscious um, changes in facial expressions, and it just comes along with that emotion. Same thing with like sexual pleasure. You see um, the body will um, make basic movements of um, sexual pleasure um, that's subconscious, that's not a consciously formed movement. And then the last thing the hypothalamus does is that it produces emotions and behavioral drives. So it's, it's sort of a part of um, the, the limbic system in this way. Um, for instance, there's a feeding center that's going to make you feel hungry. It's going to tell your brain you're hungry and you're actually going to feel hungry. And there's a thirst center that's going to make you feel thirsty. And then there's also a satiety uh, center that's going to make you feel full. So it's going to regulate your food intake because it's, it knows, you know, when that center is stimulated, you feel full and you're not going to eat anymore. All right, then we're going to look at the limbic system. So the limbic system is found inside um, the cerebrum. And so part of it is made up of gray matter and then part of it is made up of white matter. So it's a combination of both. It doesn't have really distinct borders to it. And so here we see it blown up and all this colored area in here, this is the limbic system. Okay, there's different areas of the limbic system. It basically functions for three ways, in three ways. 
It helps to establish your emotional state. It helps to link the conscious with the unconscious, the conscious of the cerebral cortex with the unconscious of the audit of the um, brainstem. All right. So your, your cerebral cortex contains all of your conscious uh, thoughts. And then your brainstem has all of your unconscious um, commands. And so it links the two of those together. And the third thing that it does is it facilitates memory storage and memory retrieval. So we're going to talk a little bit about these. First of all, it contains three gyri, the cingulate gyrus, the dentate gyrus, and the parahippocampal gyrus. Right. So here's the cingulate gyrus. It's the most superior. Here's the parahippocampal gyrus. It's the most inferior. And then here is the dentate gyrus, and that's the most posterior portion of the limbic system. It helps to conceal the hippocampus. Those three gyri um, sit on top of the hippocampus. So here's the hippocampus. Okay, the hippocampus resembles a seahorse of a sort. It has a long tail and a body, just like a seahorse. It's important in learning, especially in storage, memory storage and memory retrieval. It, what, it's what helps you um, to develop new long-term memories, which is what you're trying to do now in this class. Then we have an area that's called the amygdaloid, the amygdaloid. And the amygdaloid body, we can see it right here. Okay, that's another um, nuclei. That amygdaloid, uh, otherwise known as amygdala, it's the interface between the limbic system and the cerebrum. So between that area of emotions with that area of your conscious thoughts. And it's going to help to regulate your heart rate during fear and anxiety. It controls the sympathetic fight or flight response. It also links emotions with memories. Okay, so this is where your fight or flight uh, response begins. And um, this is also where, you know, the emotions with the memories. So, you know, you um, stand up in front of a, a crowd one time and, and you get really anxious about it. Well, the next time you stand up in front of that crowd, that amygdala is going to let you know right away that you're nervous about standing up in front of crowds and, and talking to a group of people. The boundaries between the hypothalamus and the limbic system are very poorly defined. They actually may share um, control of emotions like rage and fear, pain, pleasure, and sexual arousal. The cerebrum has motor, sensory, and association areas in it. It's the largest region of the brain. On the outside of the brain, we have gray matter. Okay, And then there's also gray matter in a really deep area of the cerebrum that's called the basal nuclei. And then in between the cortex and the basal nuclei, we have white matter. The cerebral cortex is about one to four and a half millimeters thick. And overall, if it's all stretched out, there's about 2.5 square feet of flat surface area. There is a longitudinal uh, cerebral fissure that separates the right and the left cerebral hemispheres. The cerebrum has a unique pattern of sulci and gyri, kind of like a fingerprint. There's a central sulcus. And in front of that central sulcus is a gyrus called the precentral gyrus. And behind that central sulcus is a gyrus called the postcentral gyrus. We can also see um, this lateral sulcus. And the lateral sulcus divides the temporal lobe from the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. The different lobes of the cerebrum are the temporal lobe, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe. The central sulcus actually divides the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. There's another sulcus called the parieto occipital sulcus that we can see dividing the occipital lobe from the parietal lobe. Deep to the cortex is the cerebral white matter. The white matter contains axons that are divided into fiber groups. The first group are called the association fibers. These are all the association fibers. The association fibers connect the cortex in one hemisphere. 
So this is just one hemisphere and we can see some long ones here and we can see some short ones here. The short ones are called arcuate fibers. So these short ones, they're just in one hemisphere. So this would be just the left hemisphere. We see these short little ones called arcuate. They look like little tiny arcs. And the longer ones are called longitudinal. So they might extend all the way from the back of one hemisphere to the front of that same hemisphere. Then there are commissural fibers, and these connect between the two hemispheres. So these are going to be white um, axons. They're going to be myelinated axons that connect the right hemisphere with the left hemisphere. One of them is called the corpus callosum. So here we see the fibers of the corpus callosum. And the other one is called the anterior commissure. So we see the other ones right here. The corpus callosum actually has um, 200 million axons that send 4 billion impulses per second between those two hemispheres. Here's another picture where we can see the corpus callosum right here. This is the white matter called the corpus callosum that connects the right and the left hemisphere. Then we have projection fibers. And so here you can see the projection fibers right here. Those projection fibers link the cortex of the cerebrum to the diencephalon and to the brainstem and to the cerebellum and to the spinal cord. So it's basically linking the cortex to the rest of the brain. The entire collection of these projection fibers are known as the internal capsule. The basal nuclei is gray matter inside the white matter, which is inside the gray matter of the cerebral cortex. So this picture is showing the basal nuclei. All of this red area in here is the basal nuclei. So the cerebral cortex out here, cerebral cortex functions consciously, right? That's what's going to tell you consciously what to do. Whereas the basal nuclei directs commands and processes your sensory information at an unconscious level. Okay, so it's going to receive sensory information and process that, and then it's going to send out commands at an unconscious level. You're just not consciously aware of it. The basal nuclei are masses of gray matter in each hemisphere, and they are embedded in that cerebral white matter. Uh, we used to call it, like I told you, the basal ganglia, but ganglia are only found in the peripheral nervous system, so we've changed that name, and now we only say the basal nuclei. There are different nuclei of the basal nuclei. First, we have the caudate nucleus. The caudate nucleus is the large curving tail, which you see right here. This is the caudate nucleus. Then we have the lentiform nucleus right here. The lentiform nucleus consists of two structures, a lateral putamen and a medial globus pallidus. So here is the putamen right here. Here you can see the putamen on this picture, so it's lateral, and the globus pallidus is medial. Both of those form the lentiform nucleus. Now the um, internal capsule fibers pass right through that. So if we go back here, here are the internal capsule fibers, and they're going to pass right through that lentiform nucleus, and it makes the lentiform nucleus appear striped. So let's talk about what the basal nuclei does. The basal nuclei directs your subconscious control of your skeletal muscle tone. It also coordinates your learned movement pattern. So what it doesn't do, it does not initiate a movement. So it doesn't start you walking. But once a movement is underway, the basal nuclei provides a pattern and a rhythm. So it doesn't initiate the walking and it doesn't cause the walking to stop. But while you are walking, it helps to set your rhythm of walking. Same thing of when you're picking up a pen. The basal nuclei adjusts your shoulder and stabilizes your arm so that you can pick that pen up nice and smoothly. It doesn't start you picking it up and it doesn't stop you from picking it up, but it does adjust that rhythm. The basal nuclei alters your motor commands that are coming from your cortex, and it does that through a feedback. The basal nuclei is inhibited by dopamine, okay? So without dopamine, now where did we get the dopamine from? That's right, the substantia nigra. 
substantia nigra secretes dopamine. And then the dopamine inhibits the basal nuclei. So without dopamine, the basal nuclei is too active. And so when it's too active, um, you're going to get a increase in muscle tone. And that increase in muscle tone is going to make a person appear with Parkinsonism symptoms. And so it gives you, there's like too much muscle tone. So you get rigid movements, you get tremors, your muscle tone is just um, working overtime and the opposing muscle groups don't relax. So if you've ever seen a person that has Parkinson's or Parkinson-like symptoms, you're gonna see that they walk very rigidly and that they have tremors. The movements too are gonna to be difficult to start and difficult to maintain. All right, now we're gonna talk about the motor, sensory, and association areas of the cortex. Some areas of the cortex deal with sensory information, some deal with motor commands, and some are areas that help to coordinate incoming sensory and outgoing motor information. So let's look at the cortex. The cortex, first of all, it's going to receive information from the opposite side of the body, and then it's gonna send commands out to the opposite side of the body. Okay, so it receives and sends from the opposite side of the body. So let's look at the motor areas first. Here we see the cerebral cortex, and this is the central sulcus. And if we look right in front of the central sulcus, we have a gyrus that's called the precentral gyrus. Now the functional name for that precentral gyrus is the primary motor cortex. The primary motor cortex is going to send out commands to direct voluntary movements. So the cell bodies in the um, motor cortex here, in this primary motor cortex, they look like little pyramids. So a lot of times we call this area the pyramidal system. You might, you'll probably hear that term uh, at some point in pharmacology somewhere, you're gonna hear pyramidal system. That just means it's the primary motor cortex. It's the area of the brain that sends out motor commands. And that's just because the cell bodies look like little pyramids. The neurons are actually called pyramidal cells. And so the um, primary motor cortex, if you think of it like a keyboard on a piano, you know, with the white and the black keys on the piano, and if you strike a certain key, that's gonna cause a certain muscle to contract. And if you strike another key, a different key, it's going to cause another, a different muscle to contract. So it's just like the keyboard of a piano. All right, let's look at the um, sensory area. So right behind the central sulcus, we have a uh, gyrus that's called the post-central gyrus anatomically, but functionally, it's called the primary somatosensory cortex. This cortex receives information. It receives um, sensations of touch, pressure, pain, vibration, and temperature that's coming from the thalamus and it makes you aware of these sensations. So you become consciously aware of those sensations at that point. Um, the other um, sensations, the special sensations like sight, sound, smell, and taste, those are gonna be received at other special areas in the cortex. So uh, for instance, um, from what you see, that information is gonna be received by the visual cortex. So coming from the thalamus, coming from the lateral geniculate, that information is going to go to the visual cortex in the occipital lobe. Auditory information is going to be received in the auditory cortex, which is in the temporal lobe. What you smell um, is going to be received in the olfactory cortex in the temporal lobe. And what you taste is going to be received in the gustatory cortex which is in the frontal lobe. Now, some of these um, areas, these cortex areas, have association areas. These are areas that are gonna interpret the sensory information and then coordinate a motor response. Kind of like the gauges of a car must be interpreted by the driver. So you're looking at the gauge that says your gas tank is low, but you have to interpret that it's low and then decide um, how to fix that, okay? So the sensory association areas interpret incoming information that arrive at the cortex. So let's start by looking at um, what those are. First of all, if we look at the primary sensory cortex, 
So this primary somatosensory cortex is receiving information about all your general senses. General senses, again, are, are senses where your receptors are found all over your body. So pain, temperature, vibration, touch, things like that. So the primary somatosensory cortex receives that information from the thalamus. The somatosensory association area is right next to that primary somatosensory cortex. Okay? The somatosensory association area is going to interpret um, what that is. So it allows you to sense that you've been touched, like when there's a mosquito on your arm, and then it can interpret that that's a bug. And then it can even coordinate a response for you to slap that bug and get it off your arm. Okay, so then we have, if we look at the visual cortex right here, right next to the visual cortex is the visual association area. The visual association area is going to interpret what the visual cortex received. So the visual cortex might receive information when you're reading. It's receiving information um, and telling you that you're seeing symbols. But it's the visual association area that's telling you what those symbols are. It's telling you that the symbol looks like a C, or that the symbol looks like an A, or that the symbol looks like an R. And then the visual association area can put those together and they spell car, right? And that can interpret what that word is. If you have damage to that visual association area, then um, you would be able to see symbols because your visual cortex wasn't damaged, but you wouldn't be able to know that they are letters and you wouldn't be able to form words. Then we have the auditory association area. So here's the auditory association area and it's right next to the auditory cortex. The auditory cortex receives what you hear. So it's receiving sound. And then it's that auditory association area that helps you to recognize words from that sound. Okay, so those are the sensory association areas. Then there's also a motor association area. A motor association area coordinates learned movements. It doesn't do anything on its own. You know, like, um, like a key on a piano, it can't make a note until somebody strikes it. So it has to be stimulated by other neurons in the cortex. So here's the, the primary motor cortex, okay? And here is the premotor cortex right here. This is the um, motor association area, the premotor cortex. So the premotor cortex can actually store learned patterns of movement, like following lines of typing to read. Right? So your eyes, they have to move from left to right as you're reading across a page. And if that area were damaged, you wouldn't uh, be able to read a line. Even though you could understand individual words, you wouldn't be able to read from left to right and, um, and, and read that sentence. Another thing is um, you wouldn't be able to pick up a glass or you wouldn't be able to play the piano because those are also learned patterns of movement. You learned how to pick up a glass. You learned how to play the piano. So you could make movements, you just wouldn't be able to do these patterns. So basically, the premotor cortex has muscle memory. That's where you store your memory for your muscles. In addition to the association areas, there are also these integrative centers in the cortex. These integrative centers are oftentimes located on one cerebral hemisphere, but not on the other. They receive information from the association areas. So they're receiving information from the auditory association area and the visual association area and the somatosensory association area. They're getting all that information. The uh, first one is the prefrontal cortex. So here we see the prefrontal cortex. It's this big blue area in the frontal lobe. The prefrontal cortex receives information from the sensory association areas and then it predicts consequences, right? So it's not fully developed until a person's in their 20s. If there's damage to that area, a person wouldn't really be able to answer, you know, what happened first? How long did that happen? How long ago did that happen? Um, they wouldn't be able to answer things like that. They wouldn't be able to predict consequences like, what bad thing would happen if they did this or did that. Okay, so 
that's that's the uh, prefrontal cortex and there's also emotions that are involved in the prefrontal cortex as well that help a person to understand the consequences of their emotions and to kind of keep their emotions in check and so if that prefrontal cortex is overstimulated a person could um, have the type of rage that would cause them to do bad things right break things or hurt people so these integrative centers the prefrontal cortex is not um, localized to one hemisphere but the rest of them that the other two that I'm going to talk about they are localized to one hemisphere and we call that hemispheric lateralization uh, we have the Wernicke's Wernicke's so we see that this is spelled with a W but it's pronounced with a V so Wernicke's area this area here right at the end of the lateral sulcus uh, it's in the left hemisphere only and it's kind of near the auditory cortex this comprehends language okay that makes sense that it's near the auditory cortex then because it comprehends language it's going to receive information from the sensory association areas and then it's going to coordinate access to your memories to both your visual memories and your auditory memories so you can remember what your hat looks like you can remember what a hat is and you can remember what your wife is and there was one book that I read once called the man who mistook his wife for a hat and he was a um, kind of a famous musician and eventually this area degenerated and he went to his friend who was a psychiatrist and um, his psychiatrist would notice that he would not be able to coordinate proper motor commands because he didn't have that access to his visual and auditory memories and so he understood when his friend the psychiatrist said you can put on your hat and you and your wife can leave but he couldn't coordinate the motor um, portion to that and he would try to pick up his wife and um, put her on his head like she was a hat so that's funny but um, also it just shows how Wernicke's area can cause a disruption in that coordination of memory and response then we have Brokaw's area Brokaw's area is right here this also is in the left hemisphere only this is your motor speech area so it's associated with speech production it coordinates and regulates your breathing patterns and your vocalizations uh, it's going to control the muscles of your respiratory tract your throat your tongue your cheeks your lips and it's going to allow you to make words to um, speak with damage to this area you would be able to make sounds but you wouldn't be able to make words so a person that's had a stroke and that area has been damaged they might be able to make sounds like uh 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 but they wouldn't be able to actually come up with words there's another disorder to this area which is called aphasia and this is where the auditory association area is trying to adjust for the damage to the Brokaw's area because the auditory association area can kind of remember certain words and so when there's damage uh, and the auditory association area is trying to correct for that damage a person would be able to um, talk but they're not going to come up with the right words right or they're going to talk but they're going to be using the wrong words so instead of saying let's go to the store someone with aphasia might just say something that sounds like gibberish like bike car motor and so the auditory association area is trying to come up with something um, because it knows that Brokaw's area is not working properly okay next we're going to talk a little bit about an EEG which is called an electroencephalogram this is a printed recording of electrical activity of brain waves so there's different types of brain waves that can be measured um, there's the alpha waves the beta waves the theta waves and the delta waves you just need to know a little bit about each one the alpha waves are found in a healthy awake adult with their eyes closed and when that healthy adult is sleeping or when they're working on a task you can no longer see those alpha waves the beta waves those are waves when a person is paying attention to something when they're concentrating on a task when they're under stress or when they're under psychological tension so you can see those beta waves 
they get bigger and more rapid than what you see in a alpha wave. The theta waves, those are transiently found, so they're not all the time, but they're um, transiently found in normal sleeping adults. If they're seen in an adult that's awake, that may indicate that they have a tumor. We can also see these theta waves in a frustrated adult, an intensely frustrated adult, or in children. Then we have the delta waves. So the delta waves are these bigger waves at the bottom here. Okay, The delta waves are normal sleep waves of all ages. Um, in addition to that, we also see those in infants who are awake, and we also see those in adults who are awake that have tumors, uh, a brain tumor, or that has some type of vascular blockage or some type of inflammation of the brain. So the EEG shows synchronized patterns, and then the tumor or injury would disrupt those patterns. So that's what we're sometimes looking for in these EEGs. A seizure is a temporary disorder with abnormal movements or unusual sensations or even inappropriate behaviors. Uh, the signs and symptoms of a seizure depends on the area of the brain that's been affected. So what area of the cortex has been affected will, will cause uh, specific symptoms or signs. So for instance, if the primary motor cortex has been affected, then a person's going to have abnormal movements. But if the auditory cortex is affected by the seizure, then they're going to hear strange sounds. So we get with seizures, um, there are marked changes of the EEG, and this may actually spread across the cortex. Okay, now we're going to look at the cranial nerves. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves. So there's 12 on the right and 12 on the left. We can see on this picture all of the cranial nerves as they are exiting from the brain. And we see the cranial nerve um, one, which is the olfactory nerve. That's going to be at the highest point, the most superior point on the brain. And then as we go down to cranial nerve two, three, four, all the way down to 12, 12 will leave the central nervous system at the very lowest or most inferior portion of the brain stem. Okay, now with the cranial nerves, you just have to be able to tell whether they're sensory, motor, or if they contain both sensory and motor fibers. And so um, if you write those down, cranial nerve one, two, three, all the way down to 12, and you use the mnemonic, some say marry money, but my brother says bad business marry money, then you'd be able to tell S is sensory, M is motor, and B is both sensory and motor. So you can tell then if it's carrying sensory or motor fibers. So for instance, olfactory would be sensory, that would be for the sum, optic would be sensory, that's say, oculomotor is motor, money, so on and on, okay? And then you have to memorize the nerves, um, the names of the nerves, so cranial nerve one is olfactory, and on and on. And then you have to memorize what motor command it's um, sending out or what sensation it's interpreting. So let's just go through them quickly. Um, this picture is a picture of the olfactory nerve. The olfactory nerve is sensory for the sense of smell. The optic nerve, you can see the two optic nerves coming from the eyeballs. Here's the optic nerve on this picture. Uh, this is a big nerve that doesn't go to a muscle. It goes into the back of the eyeball. All right, so this was going to bring back all of your visual information. The oculomotor nerve, the one on the top, and the trochlear nerve, the one in the middle here, and the abducens nerve, the one on the bottom, those are going to move the eyeball. In addition to that, the oculomotor nerve right here, this one goes to the pupil of the eye as well, and so it's going to cause the, the pupil to constrict. This is the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve has three branches. It has one going to the eye, the um, ophthalmic, it has one going to the nose, and it has one going to the mouth. So what it does is both motor and sensory, and uh, so touch to the face, anytime you touch your face, it's picking up that information and bringing it back to the brain. And then it also controls the, the muscles of chewing, so it controls the, mus the masseter muscle and will send out information telling that masseter muscle to contract so you can chew.
Then we have the facial nerve. The facial nerve is actually both sensory and motor as well. For motor, it's sending out motor commands to your facial muscles so that you will um, have facial expressions. You can squint your eyeballs, you can raise your eyebrows, you can smile, you can frown. All of those things are commanded by that facial nerve. And then also the sensory portion of it is that nerve goes into the tongue, to the anterior two thirds of the tongue, and it is bringing back the sensation of taste. Uh, for anything that you're tasting on the front of your tongue, it's going to go back to the thalamus by the facial nerve. Here we have the cranial nerve 8, which is the vestibulocochlear nerve. This nerve uh, is going to bring sensory information back to the thalamus. Uh, it brings back hearing, so the sense of hearing, which comes from the cochlea here. It's going to go back to the brain by the vestibulocochlear nerve. And then the sense of balance, which occurs in the semicircular canals and the vestibule, um, they're going to go back by the vestibular nerve. They come together as the vestibulocochlear nerve, and that information is going to go back to the thalamus. Then we have the glossopharyngeal nerve. So this nerve, we can see it exits um, the brain stem, and then some of the branches are going to go to the tongue. So the tongue, another name for that is glossus, and another branch is going to go into the throat area to the um, salivary glands and down into um, the carotid. Okay, so it's going down into the throat area, so or into the neck. So we call this the glossopharyngeal nerve. The glossopharyngeal nerve is both sensory and motor. Sensory, it is picking up the sensation of taste from the back of your tongue, so from the posterior one-third of your tongue. And then it's also controlling, if you see that it's going into these muscles of the throat, it's controlling the muscles for swallowing. Next we have cranial nerve 10. This is the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is both sensory and motor. It's called vagus because it travels like a vagrant. You can see it go down into the chest area and then it goes down into the abdominal area. It's going to the stomach and the um, intestinal area. It goes to the heart and to the lungs. So it's a vagrant. It's the only cranial nerve that goes below the neck. It's going to be both sensory and motor. It's, it's um, picking up the sensations um, from the heart and the lungs and the stomach, and then it's sending out motor commands. And so um, sometimes when a person is having a rapid heart rate and their, their heart is just beating very, very rapidly, tachycardia, one of the things that a, an EMT or a paramedic can do is have them try to bear down like they're having a bowel movement. And that will squeeze on the heart and it'll squeeze, put pressure on the vagus nerve. And that, that pressure on the vagus nerve might stimulate that vagus nerve to start working and will cause the heart to slow down. If you remember from general A&P, the vagus nerve is 75% of the parasympathetic activity. And parasympathetic activity slows down the heart. So by stimulating the vagus nerve, we can slow down the heart. The next nerve is the accessory nerve. That's cranial nerve 11. The accessory nerve is going to send messages to the muscles of your neck, like the SCM, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and the trapezius muscle. So it sends messages to those muscles so they contract. The accessory nerve is motor only. The last one that we have is called the hypoglossal nerve, and hypo means under, so it's going under the tongue. Okay, hypoglossal, under the tongue. And what this one does, it's motor only, it controls your um, tongue movement. So when you ask a person to stick out their tongue, their tongue should go straight out and not off to the side. All right, so what you're going to do in lab then is you're going to get together with a partner or you're going to get together in a group of three and you are going to practice running through and screening these cranial nerves. And we'll talk more about that when we get to lab. Last thing is I want to talk about some cranial reflexes. Cranial reflexes are automatic responses to cranial nerve stimulation. So for instance, um, you have some somatic cranial reflexes. These are reflexes that are going to muscle. So your corneal reflex, you know, when you're blinking, you get something in your eye and you blink, that is a corneal reflex. And that's a somatic cranial nerve reflex. That's happening because your cranial nerves have been stimulated. Right. Um, there's also um, 
a visceral reflex. So this is a pupillary reflex. So your pupil is going to constrict when you shine a bright light into your eye. And that stimulates that oculomotor nerve so that your pupils constrict. Okay? The corneal reflex is the trigeminal nerve that's being stimulated. And then the pupillary reflex, that's your oculomotor nerve. Now, there's another thing that's called consensual light reflex. And that means that even though you're shining the bright light into one pupil, both pupils are going to constrict. And that's because that is um, those that bright light is being sent to that colliculus. Do you remember which one? Superior, inferior? That's right, superior, right? Superior is for the eyes. And then you get this reflex where those pupils, both pupils then are going to constrict. A concussion is the most common brain injury. And this is where we have, um, it's a, um, an injury that's gonna affect some of these um, cranial reflexes. If a person has an acute concussion and only one, it would be like a temporary acute concussion happened one time, they might end up with headaches or light sensitivity or confusion or slurred speech. These are affecting their cranial nerves. So by testing their cranial nerves and going through a screening of their cranial nerves after a person has had a head injury, you can see if they have a concussion. If they've had chronic concussions where they've had repetitive brain injuries, repetitive brain trauma, then they're going to have different symptoms like diminished concentration or possibly mood disorders like depression or maybe personality changes like anger and aggression. It can lead to a cognitive decline where they don't understand numbers well or they, they can't think as clearly as they used to. And it could also lead to memory loss. Uh, on autopsy, a person that's had these chronic concussions, you usually see a diffuse atrophy of the brain and enlarged ventricles. These symptoms of chronic concussions are going to be especially vulnerable in people who have a first concussion and then they don't take the proper rest needed after that first concussion and then they get a second concussion right away. All right, well, that's it. That's the end of chapter 14. I know this was long, but this is your lecture, and I will see you guys soon.